We started buying bigger cars and driving longer distances. Most of the uh, uh, fuel efficiency standards just basically uh, became irrelevant. And the same thing has continued basically up to the present. Uh, energy policy has become largely militarized. Uh, we've looked to phantoms like uh, corn-based ethanol as a way of uh, supplanting or supplementing our reliance on uh, continually growing reliance on imported oil. And meanwhile, we've continued to support the fossil fuel indus industries themselves with enormous tax breaks. Through all this time, uh, we have tried to keep the message of M. King Hubbard at bay. And we do this at the highest official levels. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. Geological Survey <clears throat> have uh, maintained a, an enormous happy face telling us that uh, the, the U.S. and the world have uh, enormous supplies of fossil fuels. After U.S. oil production had peaked, the USGS continued to insist that the U.S. had something like 600 billion barrels of oil reserves. Well, of course, that was ridiculous. Uh, in fact, when all's said and done, the U.S. will probably be seen to have had about 220 billion barrels altogether when we started out the whole process of extracting it. And we've, we've gotten most of that out of the ground already, about 80, 85 percent. That's even counting these uh, dribs and drabs in the uh, off-limits areas in Anwar and uh, California coast. So in 1999, for example, the USGS released a, a, a groundbreaking report that's still referred to by e energy agencies around the world where they said, uh, well, yes, the world oil discoveries have been declining since the early 1960s, and, and, and that is some cause for concern, but that's going to turn around. Over the next few years and decades, we'll start discovering more and more and more oil and uh, as a result, we won't have to worry about uh, any kind of shortfall in, in global oil supplies for the foreseeable future, at least out beyond 2035. Well, that was 1999. That's almost 10 years ago. How, has, uh, how have those forecasts panned out? Well, we haven't found all of that new oil. In fact, the trend for new discovery has basically followed that low case scenario which the uh, USGS authors didn't even spend much time on because they thought it was so pessim pessimistic it wasn't worth even discussing. <clears throat> so what's happened, in fact, is that one country after another has followed the US in going over that oil production peak. We peaked in 1970. Uh, Great Britain and Norway have now peaked uh, the, the North Sea and uh, declines of production there have been really staggering. Currently, more countries are declining than are advancing. And so it, it stands to reason that at some point, perhaps in the very near future, global oil supplies will reach that point of no return, where it's not that we will have run out of oil, but that we will have gotten out of the ground all of the cheap, easy stuff. It's the, it's the low-hanging fruit phenomenon that everyone's familiar with. Naturally, as we look for resources and extract resources, we go after the cheapest, the highest quality, and the easiest access resources first. First, we drilled Pennsylvania, then Ohio. Then we went for Texas and Southern California and Oklahoma. Only after those places were having trouble did we bother to go all the way to Alaska and then to deep water in the Gulf of Mexico. Now we're talking about the North Pole. We're talking about ultra deep water. We're talking about extracting stuff that isn't even oil that is uh, such low grade hydrocarbon that it takes al almost as much energy to extract and process the stuff as it yields in the end. Is this a problem? You betcha. <laughs> As we saw at the very beginning of this presentation, it's all about energy. You know, when so many economists look at uh, the question of energy, oil, supplies, and so on, they look at these things purely from the standpoint of dollars and cents. Energy is a component of the economy. How big a component? Well, how much of GDP do we spend on energy? That's how big a component it is. That's not the way to look at this. Energy is all of the economy. 
if we don't have energy, the economy stops, right? If the electricity isn't available, and when we turn on the light switch, nothing happens, what does that do for the internet? What does that do for, for this conference we're enjoying today? It all stops, it comes to a halt until we can get the, the lights on again. The same thing with oil for our cars. If the gas stations run out, the 18 wheelers stop supplying the, the grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera. Energy is the economy. So there was an important study done uh, just about three years ago for the US Department of Energy uh, by a consulting firm called Science Applications International Corporation. And they were asked, you know, is the peaking of global oil supplies, would that be a problem? And they came back with a, a hundred page report. This is the, the, ex the first paragraph of the executive summary of the report. It says the peaking of world oil production presents the US and the world with an unprecedented risk management problem. As peaking is approached, liquid fuel prices and price volatility will increase dramatically. Notice, prices and price volatility. That's what we've seen this last year. Oil prices going from under $100 to almost $150 back down to a little over 50. That's extreme price volatility. And without timely mitigation, the economic, social, and political costs will be unprecedented. Now they don't use this word unprecedented lightly, obviously, because they've used it twice. In effect, they're saying this is a bigger problem than the Great Depression or World War II. They go on to say viable mitigation options exist on both the supply and demand sides, but to have substantial impact, they must be initiated more than a decade in advance of the peaking. Why? Because it takes time to deploy all of the strategies that we're going to need. Yes, we could build more fuel efficient cars, but it takes a little while to retool the factories to build those more efficient cars and then not everybody buys a new car every year as we're finding out right now. In fact, it takes about 15 years to change out the whole fleet in good times. So this is about a 20 year strategy just to make our fuel, uh, our, our auto and truck fleet more fuel efficient. Everywhere you look, whether it's building new renewable energy in infrastructure or uh, or making our existing infrastructure more energy efficient, it's the same thing that requires investment, requires time. So if we wait for the market to sort this out, if we wait for the oil price to shoot through the ceiling and then say, oh, now we'd better do something, we'll be 20 years too late, in effect, to make that energy transition in a proactive and somewhat gentle fashion. This is just a chart of the the correlation, the close correlation between energy price spikes and the onset of recessions. 1975, 1980, 1990. Now we've just had the mother of all oil price spikes and I think we should be getting ready for the mother of all recessions, frankly. This is not gonna be a couple of quarters of economic downturn. We're going to see years of very, very serious impacts to our entire economy. And what's happened, of course, is that with the onset of recession, then that lowers demand for oil. So the, that's part of what has brought oil prices down. The other part of what's, what's done that is the fact that hedge fund managers who had been buying a lot of uh, oil futures back in the early part of, of, nine, of 2008, because they wanted to put their money in commodities, commodities were hot, et cetera, there were lots of reasons for doing so. In the last couple of months, they've had to withdraw their money from commodities, futures, in order to cover their other bets, in effect. So that's caused the price of oil to overshoot on the downside. Again, extreme price volatility. And what does price volatility do? It hinders us from adapting if the oil price went up to $100 and stayed there, everybody would say, oh, well, that changes the picture. Now, investments in renewable energy and all of these other things make sense. But, but instead, we don't know what the price of oil is going to be next year, whether it's going to be $40 or $300, literally. If anyone tells you what the price of oil is going to be next year, don't believe them because nobody can possibly know at this point. <clears throat> 